Hello, and welcome to the challenge of adding and switching antipsychotics. My name is Shane Martin. I'm a clinical pharmacist at the Chillicothe, Ohio VA Medical Center. Our objectives for today are to briefly outline current pharmacological approaches to the management of schizophrenia, to review common indications and challenges associated with antipsychotic switching and discontinuation, and to review strategies for antipsychotic switching and discontinuation, as well as some patient monitoring and counseling points. Since the introduction of Thorazine in the 1950s, antipsychotics have really been the mainstay of pharmacotherapy for schizophrenia. Currently, second generation or atypical agents are generally preferred over the first generation or typical agents, primarily due to some differences in side effects that will be reviewed during this presentation. But really with the exception of clozapine, and this is in the case of treatment-resistant schizophrenia, the selection of antipsychotic drugs is based upon factors other than a proven superiority in efficacy for one drug over the other one. So we're going to be really choosing drugs based upon their side effect profiles. Now, because there is incomplete efficacy with the use of these medications in schizophrenia, and because they have some differing side effect profiles, switching is fairly common in this disorder. And some of the more common reasons for switching are inadequate therapeutic response. And really, before this is uh, determined, the following needs to be assessed. Is the patient adherent? Are they taking the medication? Is the dose appropriate? Have they been on the medication for a significant duration to really determine if they've had a good response? Are there drugs of abuse involved that are really working against any therapeutic benefits that may be gained from the medication? And is the diagnosis correct? Another common reason are intolerable side effects or even some long-term health risks uh, such as dyslipidemias, weight gain, hyperglycemia that are associated with many of these medications. And then cost, the financial aspect of care, can also be a reason to switch medications. The goals of switching, if we're dealing with a patient who's currently unstable, the hope is that we will be able to improve their symptomatic and functional level with a new medication. If the patient is currently stable, then we hope that we can maintain their symptomatic and functional level with the introduction of a, of a different medication. And then we would like to improve, or at least not worsen, medication tolerability and overall health. Now, while it's pretty common to switch medications, to switch antipsychotics and schizophrenia, how effective that switch is going to be uh, is another issue. And it's a question that's still really being answered. Uh, with the exception of clozapine, uh, the evidence isn't all, isn't all that uh, outstanding that any one uh, medication works better than another one. And there certainly are some risks involved with switching. Now, what I have here is a little bit of data uh, from the Katie trial. Again, a, a large trial that was conducted that was supposed to, uh, in, some, in some way, mimic more of uh, the real-world conditions uh, or real-world patients that are seen in, in schizophrenia. And what I would like to point out to you here is that patients that were switched Okay, patients that were switched from their current medication to a different medication in this trial were actually more likely to discontinue the new medication than were patients that were randomized to continue with their, with their original or their current medication. So these patients were randomized, but those that were switched were actually more likely to discontinue the new medication than were patients that were continued on their current medication. And again, this treatment, uh, this treatment discontinuation can be a precipitating factor for clinical instability, for rehospitalization. So this needs to be kept in mind. And this is a, this is a finding that's pretty consistent in a couple of the other switch studies that I'll mention uh, during this presentation. The patients that are switched tend to be more likely to discontinue their medication. So unless the clinical situation really requires that a medical, that a medication change be made, prescribers should really take steps to optimize the person's current medication regimen before making a switch. So a few reasons not to switch. If a person's recently recovered from an acute episode and they're experiencing some clear benefit with their current medication, there's really not a good reason to switch at that point in time. Let the person 
have a, a longer period of stability, maybe six months, before you talk about switching medications. Again, unless there's some intolerable side effect that really requires a switch, this is not an ideal time just to, to be switching a medication. If the person is presently stable with a history of clinical instability during acute exacerbations, and again, these could be things like violence, self-harm, extreme neglect, severe symptoms, these aren't patients that you generally want to switch unless you absolutely have to. And then if the patient's presently stable on a long-acting injection with a history of clinical instability prior to long-acting injection use, you don't just want to switch on a whim. Okay, so these are some, these are things that need to be taken into consideration. Just how stable is this patient? How likely are they to become unstable uh, if they're off their medication for a prolonged period of time? So a few steps that are involved uh, when deciding to make an elective antipsychotic switch. One thing you want to do is, is kind of have your target symptoms and side effects in mind. Now have your goals in mind. And there are several questions that you really need to be asking. You know, can these be managed with adjunctive medications or perhaps other non-pharmacological strategies? Or is switch the only way to manage things? Once those target symptoms and side effects are identified, you want to translate those targets into some outcomes that can be managed. You know, something that's measurable, something that can be tracked long term to see if you're if you're if you're accomplishing your goal. As I mentioned earlier, you want to determine if that therapeutic target is even amenable to pharmacological intervention. And one of the therapeutic targets that may not be amenable to pharmacological intervention are primary negative symptoms in schizophrenia. The medications that are currently available work well or fairly well for the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, so the delusions, the hallucinations. And the second generations in particular have fewer secondary negative symptoms. But when you talk about the primary negative symptoms of schizophrenia, the deficit symptoms, none of the currently available medications, at least those available in the United States, are all that effective. So if a medication change is being made with the goal being to improve primary negative symptoms, that's not necessarily a good reason to make a switch in medication because that's not a target that's all that amenable to pharmacological intervention. Again, optimize current treatment regimen if possible, evaluate the, uh, for appropriateness of adjunctive interventions, and then conduct a risk and benefit assessment with the patient. Educate the patient about risk and benefits of new medications relative to the current side effect issues that they're dealing with, if a switch is, particularly if a switch is being made because of side effects. You want to work with the patient in deciding which medication to try next. Have some agreement there. Make a switching plan with attention to the potential sleep-wake effects of antipsychotics. And this can be particularly important because oftentimes these switches are being made uh, due to the metabolic side effects of the medications. And, and what you tend to see is the medications that tend to cause more weight gain, more dyslipidemias, uh, more problems with glucose tolerance, also tend to be the more sedating medications. And while there may be some benefit in the metabolic profile upon switching to a new medication, you can also see some rebound or withdrawal insomnia associated with it. And a significant disruption in the sleep-wake cycle can potentially be a, a precipitating event um, for some mood uh, instability. And, and again, you want to you try to avoid that. It can also be a reason uh, for, for medication discontinuation, potentially. And the patient really needs to be monitored closely during the switch. And there is going to be an increased util utilization of resources during the switch, more frequent visits, uh, more frequent follow-up. And hopefully uh, stability is maintained and you, and you don't have a hospitalization during this medication switch. Clinicians need to be alert for rebound and new onset side effects, provide short-term medication to manage sleep disturbances, agitation, anxiety, things that can occur either as withdrawal or as treatment emergent side effects, and be continually evaluating efficacy, safety, tolerability outcomes. Note that changes in side effects don't always happen at once. They, they happen at different time frames. Lipids or prolactin levels may normalize fairly rapidly. It may be uh, you know, a few weeks to, uh, to one or two months to see significant improvements there. Or as the weight may take several months before you really see benefits. So keep that in mind 
so that the patient uh, has a realistic idea of what to expect and doesn't become discouraged. Now, as far as which strategy to use in switching, there really is no clear al algorithmic approach that has been established. Typically, the more gradual or conservative approaches are often recommended and are used in studies. There can be situations where a less gradual or perhaps a more aggressive approach may be appropriate. And we'll talk about a couple of those. So the best strategy will be dependent upon evidence when available, uh, the reason for the switch, the current illness severity, and I'll add this also, the medications that are involved. Uh, because there are certain things that you could do, you know, with, with two medications that uh, with other medications you couldn't do. And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Clozaril and then iloperidone have titration schedules that have to be followed. All right, clozapine for, for both to avoid postural hypotension, but also it has to do with the CBC and ANC monitoring that's involved with that medication. Iloperidone. It has to be done uh, due to the risk of postural hypotension. So with those strategies, there's going to have to be some sort of taper involved. It may be a cross taper or it may be another tapering strategy that, that we'll discuss. But the medication involved can certainly dictate which strategies may be absolutely inappropriate and which strategies may be more appropriate. So I'm going to start by kind of contrasting a, a couple strategies. And we'll start with the abrupt switch. And with this one, the person is on drug A. They stop it, and the next day they start drug B. Again, this is a strategy um, that may be appropriate when you're switching between two pharmacologically similar medications. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, this isn't a perfect example, but I think it'll get the point across. A few months back, uh, there was a shortage of Prolix and DEC, or flufenazine. Um, and we had a lot of patients that had to be converted over to Haldol, DEC, or Haloperidol. Now, because those two drugs are pharmacologically pretty similar, they're both high potency, first generation, or, or typical antipsychotic medications, it was pretty easy to switch patients from Prolixin over to Haldol, DEC. Okay, they're pharmacologically similar. Now, it's not exactly an abrupt switch because you are dealing with a long acting injection, so there's maybe a little bit of a natural taper uh, that, that occurs there. But say there was a shortage of, the shortage had been prolixin oral as opposed to DAC, and we switched patients over from prolixin or flufenazine oral over to Haldol or Haloperidol oral, we could have done an abrupt switch with those patients and it had a reasonable uh, level of confidence that we weren't going to see a whole lot of clinical instability. That certainly could have been, a, have been an approach that could have been taken because they're pharmacologically similar. They're both high potency uh, uh, first generation agents. There's not a whole lot of difference between those two drugs. If you're dealing with drugs that aren't as pharmacologically similar, then this approach becomes more problematic because there's certainly, at least in theory, a greater risk for withdrawal symptoms when you switch, you know, withdrawal symptoms from A when you switch to B. Uh, also, I, I, with this particular strategy, a greater risk possibly for, for side effects uh, from drug B too because you're starting at a therapeutic dose, you know, right from the get-go. It's not a gradual tapering up. Other than maybe switching between, you know, first generation typicals or between, you know, low potency to low potency first generations or high potency to high potency first generations, um, there may not be a whole lot of other situations where this is the most appropriate strategy to use. Cross taper is the one that's most commonly used. At least theoretically, there's less risk for withdrawal with this strategy. There's also less risk for a more for a rapid clinical deterioration. Clinical deterioration certainly could happen, but the thought is that you should see it happen uh, more gradually. Hopefully, it can be caught before a person has a full-blown episode, and some intervention can be made to prevent hospitalization. Now, again, some of the uh, perhaps weaknesses of this approach: one is side effect because a person is going to be on two medications for a while. Another potential disadvantage that there, there could be some uh, some patient confusion. The person may not understand uh, exactly the instructions for cross tapering because in this strategy you sort you have two moving parts. You're increasing one medication while you're concurrently decreasing another one. And there can be some confusion involved in this strategy. Uh, another potential disadvantage is that there's certainly there's a temptation to keep the patient on two medications for a prolonged period of time. 
you know, say the switch was being made because the patient hadn't had a very robust clinical response in the midst of the, of the, uh, of the cross taper, all of a sudden the patient's doing better than they have in, in months or better than they have in years. There's temptation to not continue with the goal of converting them over to a new monotherapy and leaving the patient on two drugs for a prolonged period of time, which, which is not appropriate. So that's another potential weakness here. Now, how the cross taper is done, typically conducted over about three to four weeks, and what you will have is about a 25 to 33% increase and decrease in the two medications over, over that time period. And again, the goal is to convert them from one monotherapy to a new monotherapy. A slight variation on the cross taper is this cross taper with a plateau stage in it, involved in it. Again, how this differs is that the person is maintained on their current medication while the new medication is tapered up. They're maintained at their, at their current dose of their current medication while the new medication is tapered up. Once the new medication is tapered up, they're maintained on both medications for a period of time, and then there's a gradual discontinuation of the original medication. Again, compared to the other cross taper strategy, perhaps more risk of side effects, particularly during that plateau stage, but theoretically there may be a little bit less risk for withdrawal or for a more rapid clinical deterioration. Again, because you are more slowly uh, discontinuing that initial agent. And that becomes particularly important if, you're, if this is a switch that's being done due to side effects in a patient that's currently stable. If, you know, if the person is currently stable, you're worried more about instability, obviously. Again, cross taper is generally preferred, particularly for a stable patient or for a patient who's had a history of clinical instability during an acute exacerbation, because this is a strategy that can at least theoretically re reduce those risks the greatest. Now, there's a couple other tapering strategies that are used that don't involve a cross taper per se. Uh, there's both an ascending and a descending strategy. So we'll look at the ascending taper switch. Again, with this strategy, the person is maintained on their current dose of their current medication while the new medication is gradually tapered up. Once that new medication is tapered up to the target dose, the original medication is abruptly discontinued. Again, a slight variation on the ascending switch, on the ascending taper switch is the ascending plateau switch. Again, Patients maintain on their current dose of current medication while the new medication is tapered up. You have a, a plateau stage here. After that plateau stage, the original medication is abruptly discontinued. So what are the, some of the pros and cons of this strategy? Well, if the person is currently stable, there's perhaps more risk for instability with this, medic, this strategy. Because if they're currently stable, then I'm adding a new medication on board. You know, I'm not going to see an improvement in stability if the person is already stable. And I, I'm really not going to have any idea of how efficacious this new medication is going to be to maintain that st stability until after I remove the original medication. And because I'm removing it abruptly, I've got more risk for, for not only withdrawal and rebound symptoms, uh, a more rapid onset of clinical deterioration. All right, now if the person is, is currently unstable, they're not stable, well then if I see some improvement in stability uh, during the titration, titrating up the new medication, then I can be more comfortable with the abrupt discontinuation of the older medication because it wasn't providing a whole lot of therapeutic benefits, uh, whereas the therapeutic benefits that we're seeing uh, were seen after the addition of the new medication. Now here's the descending taper switch. Again, in this strategy, the new medication is quickly added at a therapeutic dose initially, followed by a gradual uh, decrease in the dose of the original medication. Again, here's a slight variation on the descending taper switch. Here's the descending plateau switch. Again, the new medication is added at a therapeutic dose quickly. There's a plateau stage where the person is maintained on on uh, full therapeutic doses of both medications for a period of time, and then there's a gradual discontinuation of the original medication. So again, pros and cons here. If the person's currently stable, again, compared to the ascending strategy, we should be able to catch the, the clinical instability here because it, 
in theory, it should be a more gradual development, you know, somewhat analogous to what we were talking about with the, with the cross taper strategy. And then if the person's currently not stable, well, if we see some improvement in stability, it can perhaps be attributed to that, to the introduction of the new medication. And again, because we're gradually tapering away the old medication, we're, we're less likely to see the abrupt onset of clinical deterioration. Again, there's less risk for withdrawal symptoms relative to the ascending taper, but there could be some more initial side effects seen with this relative to the ascending taper because you're going to be on two high doses of medication initially, particularly with the descending plateau switch strategy. So why would I ever use one of these strategies, the ascending or descending taper over the cross taper strategy? They haven't necessarily been compared to one another where there's been studies that have been conducted where papers, patients have been randomized to one strategy or the other one. But one reason to use something like this over the cross taper is that with this strategy, it may be a little bit easier to follow. Perhaps it could be a little bit easier to follow because rather than having two uh, moving parts, you know, two parts that are moving simultaneously, you know, two drugs whose doses are being changed concurrently, you're only adjusting one at a time. So perhaps it may be a little bit easier for some patients to follow. Um, otherwise, no advantages of this one over the cross taper strategy. And again, cross taper is typically uh, what is used, either in the plateau form or the, or the form without a plateau. So now let's talk about the side effect differences between the various antipsychotic medications. There's four major side effect groups that we'll spend time discussing. Uh, and these are the ones that'll be that people typically will be considering when choosing between or among the first generation and second generation antipsychotics. These groups are EPS or the extra pyramidal symptoms, uh, pseudoparkinsonism, acute dystonic reactions, akathisia, the various tardive or late onset movements uh, such as tardive dyskinesia, prolactin elevation and its effects, weight gain and its associated effects, and then QTC prolongation. This slide here lists the medications in the order of their risk for causing EPS. The medications most likely to cause EPS are your high potency first generation antipsychotics with haloperidol being the prototypical one. Uh, this is followed by the mid potency first generation drugs such as perfenazine, also Risperidone, and this is a dose dependent effect. Once you get over about six milligrams of risperidone, it causes EPS at about the same rate as a mid potency drug will. After the mid potency and risperidone, then the low potency first generation drugs. Again, something like chlorpromazine or thorazine. Amongst the second generation drugs, again, risperidone, and now we're talking dose of about six milligrams or less, is equivalent to paloperidone as far as its risk for causing EPS. Aripiprazole will cause EPS. It's primarily akathisia, but you could also see pseudoparkinsonism uh, with, with aripiprazole as well. You see a, a few other drugs that are grouped together there, all the way down to quetiapin and clozapine, which really cause minimal to no EPS. And the development of EPS is, is related to uh, antagonism on dopamine 2 receptors. And we'll, we'll discuss that here in a couple slides. As far as the risk for development of tardive dyskinesia, it's greatest with the first generation antipsychotics, uh, much greater than it is with the second generation antipsychotics. And then with clozapine, clozapine uh, really isn't associated with the development of new onset tardive dyskinesia. In fact, some patients that develop tardive dyskinesia uh, maybe switch to clozapine, and it's the only medication right now that's been associated with a reversal in tardive dyskinesia symptoms. Prolactin elevation. Again, the effects of prolactin elevation include galactorrhea, amenorrhea, gynecomastia, sexual dysfunction in both males and females, and decreased bone density. Again, the greatest risk is associated with the second generation drugs with sparadone and paloperidone, followed by first generation drugs. And then you have three medications, quetiapin, clozapine, and aripiprazole, which really cause minimal to no prolactin elevation. And again, this is related to antagonism at the dopamine 2 receptor.
common adverse effects associated with receptor blockade. We're going to focus on those associated with the dopamine with D2 receptor blockade. So antagonism in the nigrostriatal dopaminergic tract is associated with EPS and akathisia. You also see the suppression of dyskinetic movements associated with antagonism in the nigrostriatal dopaminergic tract. And this is particularly important when considering withdrawal. And, and what you can see sometimes that if a person is switched from a medication that has a high degree of antagonism at D2 to a medication that doesn't block D2, you can see these withdrawal dyskinesias develop. If a person is originally on haloperidol, switched to something that doesn't cause as much EPS, you can certainly see these withdrawal dyskinesias develop. D2 blockade in the tuberoinfundibular tract is associated with prolactin elevation, and then D2 blockade in the mesocortical tract is associated with secondary negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Now, some of the withdrawal effects when you remove a dopamine 2 antagonist in the mesolimbic dopaminergic tract, one of the potential withdrawal effects can be a rebound psychosis. This can be difficult to distinguish whether you're dealing with the rebound psychosis or a loss of therapeutic efficacy. It can be difficult to distinguish those two things. The rapid removal of D2 antagonism from the nigrostriatal tract is associated with a withdrawal dyskinesia. So how do you manage these sort of things? Slowing down the taper can certainly help to manage this. Use of a plateau taper strategy. We'll spend more time speaking about the management of tardive dyskinesia in a few slides, because that's really a topic in and of itself. Now, how are these things managed? Because oftentimes you won't necessarily make a switch among antipsychotics unless you're dealing with, with tardive dyskinesia. Acute dystonic reactions, which are sustained muscle contractions, these happen pretty rapidly. Typically, these are managed with intramuscularly administered antimuscarinic agents like benztropin or diphenhydramine or an intramuscularly administered benzodiazepine such as lorazepam. Pseudoparkinsonism, which can develop over days to weeks, it's typically managed by decreasing the dose of the antipsychotic if possible, if it can be decreased without losing therapeutic benefits, or antimuscarinic agents, oral antimuscarinic agents such as benztropine, trihexafenadyl, or artane, and diphenhydramine are commonly used. Amantadine is also used sometimes to manage pseudoparkinsonism. Uh, akathisia, which is an internal feeling of restlessness, which is manifested with psychomotor agitation. This can be managed by a dose decrease, if as long as therapeutic benefits are not lost with that. Sometimes uh, by a beta blocker, specifically propranolol is used, or oral lorazepam can also be used for this. But again, typically for pseudoparkinsonism, akathisia, a, a change in medication is not always made. These are, you try to manage these things or make some doses adjustments. Now, tardive dyskinesia are late onset movements, typically after uh, six months, but it can be many years before these develop. So this is managed sometimes by decreasing the dose, by switching from a first generation drug to a second generation, or if the patient's on a second generation, switching to a second generation with a lower risk for EPS, or the use of clozapine, switching the patient to clozapine. And clozapine is the only option that is the option with the best evidence uh, for improvements uh, in TD. Switching to clozapine is the option with the best evidence for, for seeing improvements in tardive dyskinesia. So the management of prolactin elevation, if significant or bothersome symptoms develop, a switch can be considered. And again, you're going to be switching from, a, from an agent with a high risk for this to an agent to, with a lower risk of this. So schizophrenia, even independent of the use of the second generation antipsychotic drugs, schizophrenia is, has been associated with a lot of medical comorbidity, including obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. The metabolic syndrome, fairly common in patients with schizophrenia, and the use of the second generation drugs in particular increases these risks. And because of some of the long-term concerns associated with, with obesity, dyslipidemias, impairments in glucose tolerance, you may see patients switch from one antipsychotic to another one. So one of the receptors that's believed to be involved in increases in appetite and weight gain is the serotonin 2C receptor. And antagonism at this receptor is believed to 
to be at least partially responsible for some of the metabolic side effects seen with second generation antipsychotic medications. Another receptor that is believed to be involved with some of the metabolic side effects is the histamine receptor. And again, antagonism at this receptor is associated with sedation, sleep induction, uh, increased appetite with a corresponding uh, increase in weight. So how do these medications compare to one another? What you'll see here are the, the likelihood of weight gain, dyslipidemia, and hyperglycemia associated with each of the second generation antipsychotics. As you can see on this slide, clozapine and olanzapine are by far the worst in this regards. They are associated with the greatest metabolic burden. Other medications, namely aripiprazole and zeprazidone, are relatively metabolically neutral. And you will see patients perhaps lose weight if they're switched from a medication with a higher incidence of weight gain to a medication like aripiprazole or zeprazidone that isn't uh, as associated with, with as much weight gain or impairment in, uh, in lipids or in glucose tolerance. As you can see, if we look at the first generation antipsychotics, certainly the low potency agents, and again, this would be a drug such as our chlorpromazine or thorazine, is associated with weight gain and some dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia. The other, the medium potency and the high potency drugs are relatively neutral metabolically speaking. So strategies to prevent or reverse weight gain and metabolic side effects, pharmacotherapy wise, there's really not enough evidence to currently support the regular use of any specific adjunctive medication. So typically what's, what's recommended are non-pharmacological approaches, diet, exercise, and I suppose you could debate which diet is best, which exercise program uh, is most beneficial for these patients. Now, because the burden of the metabolic side effects is so great, this is one of the areas where there have been a few switch studies that have been performed, and I'm going to discuss a couple of these. So the question of how effective is switching to reduce metabolic risk for cardiovascular disease uh, was addressed studied by a newcomer and colleagues. This looked at patients with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Patients were randomly assigned to either remain on olanzapine or switch to aripiprazole via a two-week cross taper, and they were looked at for 16 weeks. The primary outcome was a mean weight change, and aripiprazole was superior to olanzapine. Patients lost on average about 1.8 kilograms, which is around 4 pounds, on aripiprazole whereas they gained 1.41 kilograms, which would be about three or three and a half pounds, while on olanzapine. Patients were more likely to have clinically relevant weight loss on aripiprazole, and they were less likely to have clinically relevant weight gain while on aripiprazole. Some of the secondary outcomes, percent change in triglycerides, favored aripiprazole. Other secondary outcomes, such as total cholesterol, HDL, non-HDL, were statistically significant for aripiprazole as well, but there were no significant changes in the LDL cholesterol, fasting glucose, fasting plasma, fasting C-peptide, or glucose tolerance test at week 16. As far as symptoms, the olanzapine patients did somewhat better on rating scales for, for symptoms, but all patients had CGIs that were in the range of minimally improved to no change. And then regarding treatment discontinuation, as was seen in the Katy study, patients that were switched to aripiprazole were more likely to discontinue treatment than patients that remained on olanzapine. Patients that were switched to aripiprazole were more likely to discontinuation treatment than were patients that remained on olanzapine. Regarding side effects, there was more insomnia seen in the aripiprazole group and this is not surprising. Uh, this may very well have been some rebound insomnia because they were switched from a medication such as olanzapine that is pretty sedating to a, to a medication, aripiprazole, which is not as sedating. But insomnia, headache and nausea were seen. There was also some insomnia seen with the olanzapine group, but to a, a lesser extent, as well as weight increase. And similar rates of EPS and use of antimuscarinic agents were seen amongst the two groups. So, in that study by my newcomer, there was some benefit as far as reducing the risk for cardiovascular disease 
are some of the markers, risk factors for cardiovascular disease when switching from a drug with a a uh, high risk for metabolic side effects to one with a lower risk for metabolic side effects. Now let's consider th another study, uh, known as the CAMP trial. It's also looked at patients with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Patients were randomly assigned to remain on olanzapine, quetiapine, or risperidone, or to be switched to aripiprazole via a three-week cross taper. Now, unlike the previous study, there was also a diet and exercise component that was incorporated into this study and these patients were evaluated for 24 weeks. The primary outcome in the CAMP trial was reduction in non-HDL cholesterol. Aripiprazole was superior to remaining on olanzapine, quetiapine, or risperidone in reducing non-HDL cholesterol. Regarding secondary outcomes, aripiprazole was superior in weight loss, BMI reduction, as well as triglyceride reduction. There was no statistically significant difference in other secondary outcomes of HDL cholesterol, LDL, C-reactive protein, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, A1C, or glucose tolerance test. As far as clinical status, there was no difference in efficacy failure between the two groups, no difference in time to efficacy failure, and no statistical difference in the number of patients or the percentage of patients that were hospitalized for psychiatric reasons during the trial. As far as treatment discontinuation, Patients that were switched to aripiprazole were more likely to discontinue medication before one month and were more likely to discontinue medication before 24 weeks. So again, that's a, a consistent trend that's been seen in, the, in these studies where patients that are switched are more likely to discontinue early. Side effects, switchers, those were, that were switched to aripiprazole had more insomnia. Those that, were, that remained on quetiapine, olanzapine, or risperidone had more sleepiness hypersomnia, nausea, dry mouth, increased appetite, and akinesia. And these would all be expected to be seen. So I mentioned earlier that many of the medications that are associated with more uh, weight gain are also more sedating, and they tend to be more um, antihistaminergic. So when you remove that antagonism at H1 receptors, you can see some withdrawal phenomenon. This can be rebound insomnia, an increase in anxiety, decrease in appetite associated with weight loss. And then how can these things be managed? Well, they can be managed uh, with the use of antihistamines such as hydroxyzine, which can be used for both insomnia or for anxiety. You can use something like a benzodiazepine, uh, which can help with, with insomnia and help with anxiety. Another effect are the anti-muscarinic effects. Antagonism at these muscarinic receptors is associated with deficits in memory and cognition. It can be associated with delirium, and then the anticholinergic effects of blurred vision, dry mouth, uh, constipation, urinary retention, and increased heart rate. So withdrawal effects include cholinergic rebound, which manifests as flu-like symptoms. So it can be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sleep disturbances, and increased sweating. Also, agitation, fear, and hallucinations are possible. And again, this is something that could be difficult to distinguish from clinical instability. It can be difficult to, to determine if this is due to withdrawal or if it's due to a lack of efficacy with the new medication to actually control symptoms. So how to manage this? Symptomatic management, possibly the use of anti-muscarinics if the symptoms are believed to be due to withdrawal or using a slower taper or use of a plateau strategy um, as well can help to prevent these withdrawal symptoms from happening, or at least prevent them from being as severe and minimizing them. Withdrawal symptoms and rebound symptoms associated with atypical antipsychotic switching. On this slide, what you can see are some of the possible emerging adverse events that can occur during switching of antipsychotics that could be attributed to withdrawal and rebound symptoms or major new limitations. So what I'm gonna do is just consider switching to and from aripiprazole as an example. If I am switching to clozapine from aripiprazole, what I can expect to see is sedation, weight gain, and metabolic disturbances, dyslipidemia, impaired glucose tolerance. I expect to see something similar if I switch to olanzapine from aripiprazole or if I switch to quetiapine from aripiprazole. I switch to, to risperidone, could be associated with some other side effects, 
but certainly an increase in prolactin would be expected. Switching to zoprazidone, some sedation, as well as an increase in prolactin, and then a switch to haloperidol from, from aripiprazole would certainly be associated with a prolactin elevation. Now let's consider switching from aripiprazole to different agents. Switching from aripiprazole to clozapine could be associated with some psychosis. And this is actually something that's been seen in a, in a few studies where people have been switched to clozapine. Some of this could just be not as much related to, to withdrawal phenomenon. It could be somewhat related more so to the types of patients that are switched to clozapine, those that are treatment resistant patients, but it is something that's been seen. Now I'll take a look at switching to aripiprazole from other agents. So switching to aripiprazole from clozapine could be associated with psychosis. And this is something that's been seen in a few studies where patients have been switched from clozapine to other agents. Insomnia as a, as a withdrawal effect agitation, anxiety, cholinergic rebound. Again, I'm being switched from something that's highly antihistaminergic, highly antimuscarinic, to something that is not very antihistaminergic and not something that's very antimuscarinic. And all of these things could be associated with or withdrawal from an antihistamine, withdrawal from an antimuscarinic agent. Again, switching from, uh, from olanzapine to aripiprazole, Similar phenomenon as is seen with the switch from clozapine. And again, they have similar receptor profiles. They're both highly antihistaminergic, both highly antimuscarinic. Switching from quetiapine to aripiprazole, again, insomnia, agitation. Both of these can be withdrawal effects from antihistamines, which quetiapine is highly antihistaminergic. It's a, it's a sedating medication. Switching from risperidone to aripiprazole, Again, you could see some dyskinesia, you could see some hyperkinesia. It all depends on the dose. It all depends on the dose. I know I asked a poll question earlier, and in that scenario, I, gave, I purposely put the person at a, at a low dose of risperidone. But if this was a higher dose of risperidone, a 6 milligram plus dose, you certainly could see some dyskinesia or some hyperkinesia associated with that change from risperidone to aripiprazole. Switching from zoprazidone to aripiprazole, uh, may not see a whole lot as far as withdrawal symptoms go. Switching from haloperidol to aripiprazole, certainly you would expect to see some dyskinesia or hyperkinesia, similar to, to the phenomenon that you would see if you were switched from a higher dose risperidone to aripiprazole. So please consider this slide, uh, the other examples that are provided, uh, but this can be a, a, a good reference source for what things to expect during a switch. Now some of the newer agents such as acinapine, iloperidone, lorazidone have not been included in as many or if any switch studies that have really assessed for, for withdrawal effects. So why would you switch to one of these agents? Again, all three agents tend to have a lower risk for metabolic side effects and EPS. Most likely you're going to be switching from a medication with a greater risk of metabolic side effects or EPS to one of these medications. So similar concerns regarding withdrawal symptoms as we saw with aripiprazole with these medications. Any special considerations for tapering? For eloperidone, it's required to titrate slowly to avoid any postural hypotension. So again, a plateau strategy or certainly some sort of cross tapering strategy is going to be most appropriate for out for eloperidone. You can't do it in an abrupt switch with this medication and nor could you do a a descending taper where you add the medication at, at full therapeutic dose immediately and then taper off the original medication. So some sort of uh, cross taper or perhaps an ascending taper would be the most appropriate thing to use for a drug like eloperidone. The last side effect that we'll consider is QTC prolongation. So the Pfizer study measured QTC prolongation in a number of of then available antipsychotic medications. And as you can see, for this particular study, the, the greatest amount of QTC prolongation was seen with thioridazine, and then second to that with, with uh, zoprazidone. And because of this study, zoprazidone does have some special labeling uh, 
regarding a monitoring for QTC prolongation. Amongst the newer medications, immediate release paliperidone at a dose of 8 milligrams daily, which is on the high end of, of the therapeutic range, has been associated with, with a QTC prolongation of 12.3. Again, that was immediate release, and it's a high dose, so it cannot necessarily be extrapolated to uh, more the extended release uh, product. And then iliparidone at 12 milligrams twice daily, which is a high dose of this medication, was associated with a QTC prolongation of 9 milliseconds. So the medications that are considered to be low risk for QTC prolongation are aripiprazole, acinapine, clozapine, lorazidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, and risperidone. So the management of this, again, try to avoid as much as possible the use of other QTC prolonging medications. Avoid use of higher risk medications in patients that are at a higher risk for ventricular dysrhythmias. Normalize electrolytes, namely potassium and magnesium, when these medications are used. And then if it's a patient that does have some risk for, uh, for QTC prolongation or has developed a prolonged QTC uh, on their current medication, switch to a medication that has a lower risk for QTC prolongation.